Howdy folks, uh, if you're watching this video, one of our own District 4 umpires for Pinole Hercules was behind the plate. This was this past summer, this was the Little League World Series. Um, okay, so what we're going to do tonight is we are going to have a softball rules clinic. Uh, but first, uh, before we start speaking, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Phil Rains, District 4, ADA for softball, and he has a couple of things he wants to go through. Thanks, Jim. So, first of all, thanks for coming to this. Uh, it'll be painless. So, just hopefully you pick a few things up for the season. But real quick, I just want to go through a roll call. I want to see what cities are here. So, if, I, if you hear your name and your division, just give me a quick yo, and uh, we'll move on from there. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Pinal. Yeah. Is someone here representing the seniors? I'm representing everybody. You're representing everybody. Yes. Clayton Valley. Uh, someone here for the major team? I'm Majors? Triple yeah. uh, A should be three teams. All three of you guys different? Yeah. Okay, perfect. And three double A teams? One, two. Okay. Wanna Creek. Um, juniors? Majors? Majors. Majors. Anybody else from Walnut Creek? That's not good. How'd you find out about the meeting? Uh, coach sent me the email. Okay. Richmond. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh seniors? Mm -hmm. Okay. Majors? Here. Here. Okay. Triple A? Okay. Double A? Perfect. East County. Seniors? Majors? Triple A? Double A? Martinez? Seniors? Ma majors? Triple A? Double A? Good job. Uh, that's all I got. So, um, real quick, any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Also, we can talk after the meeting. If something comes up, you think about it, you just want to ask a question. Other than that, uh, everyone should know how to get a hold of me during the season if something uh, comes up. Most of you probably have my phone number if you went to the scheduling meeting. Uh, and then as far as um, <clears throat> rules or anything like that, I'll do my best to help you out. Otherwise, I can refer to Jim as far as uh, asking him during the season if something comes up. Otherwise, uh, thank you for showing up. Okay, we'll work ourselves up. I also want to introduce Don Waddell. Do you want me to talk? Oh, God. Oh, please, no. He can hardly wait to stand there. I know. <laughs> Sorry, Jim, it was your meeting. And he said it was going to be painless. Yeah. yeah. Hey, welcome, and uh, I want to echo Phil's. Um, Thanks for coming out on a wet night. I think it's just going to be wet until it stops being wet, right? But um, a couple things as umpire in chief for the district, my goal is really to help all the leagues have quality umpire programs. And uh, Jim is our assistant umpire in chief for the district for softball. So if you have issues about uh, umpiring and Jim already said rules, you know, you should be going to Jim or go to me if you can't get a hold of Jim. I want to emphasize a couple things that are in in our district interleague rules about umpires. You know, to have quality softball programs, we cannot put untrained people out on the field. It's not fair to your players. It's not fair to the spectators. It's not fair to you as managers and coaches. So our interleague rules say for senior level, they need to be adults. So you need to be figuring out how you're gonna find adult umpires working with your chief umpire. For the majors level and the highest level of minor, well in majors and the AAA, AA, what we're really looking for is experienced umpires who understand the different rules that we have going on in interleague play and they can administer the game and they can make sure it's safe and that the game is moving quickly. 
because as Jim will say and Ed will say, there's a time limit going on in some of these games. So really, uh, these interleague games, and you're even in your league softball games, this is not the place to take a parent out of the stands and put them on the field untrained. It's not really the right game to put a 12-year-old brand new youth umpire on. Pair them up with somebody who's very experienced and let's have some quality games. So I'm here to listen in tonight. I've already said too much, but I want to say one more thing. Uh, we had last year, we had um, we had an umpire umpire at the Little League Softball World Series, Mark Oda from Pernol Hercules. Jim was an umpire in the Little League uh, Softball West Region Tournament, uh, along with Norm Downing from Pittsburgh. And this year, uh, we're lucky again to have uh, umpire from North South Oakland go to the uh, Junior Softball West Region Tournament in Tucson. We have Steve DePetris. Congratulations, Steve, Thank you. for your assignment to that tournament. That's all I got. Thanks for giving me too long, Jim. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, I'll be that. hanging around if you got questions. I won't make that mistake again. <laughs> Okay, let's finish with introductions. Uh, presenting tonight, the rules will be with me. Uh, if you've been here before, we've been doing this for I don't know how too many long. years, too long. Uh, Ed Newbegin, Ed Newbegin's on the District 4 training staff. He's also a Little League Regional and World Series umpire. Um, and myself, I'm Jim Rose. Uh, I'm the assistant UIC for softball. I also do District 4 trainings. I'm also on the training staff. So Ed and I are now going to take it over and we are going to run you through rules. There's a lot of stuff we're going to be going through. So what is this? This is a basic uh, clinic on softball. It's for coaches, managers, VPs, umpires, players, parents. Basically, if you have anything to do with Little League softball, you're very welcome to be here. It's a PowerPoint presentation, and there will be videos embedded in this. And our focus is minors through seniors. Unless I state otherwise, assume that if we talk about a rule, that rule is for all levels of softball, from minors all the way up to seniors. So what are we going to go through today? Well, one thing we're going to cover is rule changes for 2023. Sometimes there's a lot of rule changes, sometimes there's few. There's not that many this year, so we'll get through that fairly quickly. We're going to talk about safety and equipment. You heard Don emphasize safety, and that's one of the things we are most concerned about in Little League is the safety of our players. Uh, we're going to talk about basic Little League softball rules. So we'll be talking about pitching, we'll be talking about the circle. We'll be talking about other things that distinguish uh, Little League softball from baseball, for example, a bunt. And uh, we'll also go through District 4 interleague rules, and we will go through those for seniors, majors, and also AAA and AA. How many people here will be involved at the senior level? Raise your hand. Okay, how many people here will be involved at the major level? Okay, how many at the triple A level? Okay, how many at the double A level? Okay, great. Okay, okay so um, there are embedded into this uh, presentation several question periods. So if you have a question, don't just shoot up your hand because Unfortunately, we're not going to take that question until we hit one of those periods. There'll be a slide up that says questions. We get to that. We'll answer any and all questions you had about that particular segment. So you may have to wait a little bit. If you want to jot down your question, go right ahead. And at the end, Ed and I will hang around here. So if you have any particular questions, we didn't answer a question well, please come to us and we will answer anything for you. Um, so wait to that point. And please feel free to take pictures of any and all these slides as we go along. Have no problem with that whatsoever. All that we ask you with your phones, keep them on silent and don't hang out on your phone. Try to listen to the rules. 
Okay, this session is being recorded. Here we have the recording, and I want to thank uh, Shannon Self, Walnut Creek Little League, um, the UIC there, who has graciously volunteered uh, to record this. All our recordings of our video clinic, of our clinics, whether they're on Zoom or live, we put them on the District 4 Umpires YouTube page. So we do actually have a channel, and that is the address there. So within a couple of days, probably, Don, within a couple of days? Will this sure, be a Jim, couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> See, once again, I forgot, and I engaged him. <laughs> you can edit that. Okay. So let's get started. Let's get going with rules. So I want to just very briefly go through the rules, um, what kinds of rules there are, because I think people who are new to Little League, they, they sometimes hear local rules, interleague rules, this rule, that rule, and we need to make a distinction between these different kinds of rules. So the first thing we have are the official playing rules. We have uh, books, one on softball, one on challenger, one on baseball, and those books go through the rules. There's an introductory section which has regulations. It talks about things like mandatory play, pitching, which is uh, regulation six, and then it goes through the rules one through nine. So these are the rules that Little League plays under. So I strongly suggest either get a rule book or you can actually get one on your phone you can download the app, and it has baseball, softball, and challenger, and there's all the rules right there, and they're very easy to get to. So those are the rules that we play under, but those aren't the only rules. Um, let me backtrack one second for those rules. If you want to go through basic rules, and we're not going to talk about obstruction, interference here tonight, we're talking about specifically softball rules. So if you want that, you can go to one of our um, recorded sessions on rules. We've run three this year already, and we have one more that's coming up this Wednesday. It's been a while since I lectured so my mouth isn't quite used to it yet. Um, and they cover all the rules of baseball and softball. Again, go to that web page, click on it. They're about an hour and 15 to an hour and a half. There'll be four of them. You'll get all the rules of baseball, a lot of videos that explain those rules. And here's that page. Here's our first three rules clinics. We also did one on teenage baseball. If you're gonna do anything with teenage baseball, you can get that there. Okay, so those are the rules and regulations that we play by. Now we also have something called local rules. Little League has about 10 to 20 areas in the rule book where they give a league an option to do something or not do something. And each league decides, well, we're gonna do that, we won't do this, we'll do that. Those are local rules. Every single one of your leagues should have local rules on their website. They should be accessible to you. Now, what's also considered local rules are interleague rules. Interleague is actually considered its own local rule, uh, league. So interleague has also decided on those points. For example, courtesy runner. Courtesy runner is a local option. You can use it or not use it. So find out if your league uses it. But for interleague, we will be using uh, courtesy runner. Are you going to enforce the rule of one foot in the batter's box or not? Again, local rule. And in interleague rules, as we go through, you'll see that we've decided all these things. Now, can you have a local rule that contradicts the regulations? No, you can't. Like, for instance, can you just arbitrarily decide, hey, we're going to change the pitching distance? Well, to do that, you need a waiver, and it has to go all the way up to headquarters in Williamsport to get approval of that. So what do we have so far? We have the, regu we have the uh, playing rules, we have the local rules, mm -hmm. and we also have ground rules. 
rules. Ground rules are just those rules particular to a particular field. And this has to do with where is the dead ball area? What if a fly ball hits that tree out there and drops into fair territory? Is it a dead ball? Do we play it from there? Every single field that you play on should have ground rules. They should be written out. And if you're doing interleague, they should have been sent to uh, Phil Reigns, and he should have access to that. So when you're playing on a field, learn that kind of stuff. What are the uh, ground rules? So those are our rules. So now we're going to go through the new rules for 2023. OK, this one, not going to spend much time on it. What this says is that in seniors baseball and softball, you do not have to play a mandatory number of games to be eligible for the postseason. That means that you can have a senior softball team play zero regular season games, and then when All-Stars comes up, you can play in All-Stars. That's only for the senior division, no other division. So you don't have to be worrying about, oh, we gotta get that mandatory number of games in. Senior division, you do not have to. Okay, defensive uh, bands that are for defensive players that go around the arm or the wrist, play calling bands, these are now allowed in Little League and they have to be worn on the arm or the wrist. They cannot be worn on the belt. They can't be tucked in somebody's pocket. So if you want to wear them, they have to be on the wrist. For pitchers, they have to be on the arm that's the glove arm. And for pitchers, they cannot be white, gray, or optic yellow. That's kind of important because some of these um, uh, play calling bands actually don't have covers but have a white part to it where all the plays are, that would be illegal in Little League Baseball or softball. It has to be either something covers it or it's not going to be in white, optic yellow, or gray. Hair beads. Finally, finally, Little League is allowing hard items worn in the hair to control the hair are allowing those and they are now legal. Up until this year, year they were in fact illegal. Probably the most significant change we have this year in regular season. And that is managers and coaches can now warm up pitchers. Um, you've probably been told many times in the past if you've umpired or if you've uh, coached in Little League, hey, manager, you can't warm up your pitcher, has to be a player. Well, now, guess what? Coaches and managers, you can warm up your pitchers anytime. You can warm them up in pregame. You can warm them up in the bullpen. You can warm them up in between innings. As your pitcher comes out, your catcher is getting the gear on. You, as an adult coach or manager, can go out there and you can warm up your pitcher. However, what has not changed? Rule 803A has not changed. What that means is that we still have one minute between innings. The second, the third out is made of one inning, the next inning begins. You have one minute, the pitcher is limited to no more than eight pitches, and if they've already pitched, usually as umpires, we only allow that pitcher five or six pitches. So if your coach comes out, takes five pitches from that catcher, then your catcher comes out, and there's a real good chance your catcher isn't going to get any uh, warm-up pitches. So be very aware of that. And adults warming up pitchers will not, uh, this will not be allowed in all-stars. This is simply a regular season rule. So don't get too used to it. And no safety equipment is required. That's on you guys. Okay, the run rule. The run rule. We've had the run rule in the past, 
uh, 15 and 10 run rule. Little League has now added an eight run rule to this also. So, and this is for majors and minors here. If a team leads by 15 runs after three innings, two and a half if it's the home team, 10 runs after four innings, or now eight runs after five innings, four and a half of home team, the game comes to an end. Know that if you're doing juniors or seniors, because there's a seven inning game, majors and below is a six inning game, just add one inning to all of this. So that would be 15 runs after four innings. So this is a local option. Find out from your local league whether you use it or not. This rule will be used in all interleague softball. Okay, intentional walks. So this had been allowed last year in all of softball. What it wasn't allowed in is intermediate baseball, juniors baseball, senior baseball. Now it's allowed in those levels too. But there's a new rule added to it. Now, intentional walk, what does it mean? It means that a manager at any point in an at-bat, even before that any pitches have been thrown, can call time and say, we wish to walk this batter without pitches. And the umpire will simply put that uh, batter on first base. But this is the new rule. You can only do it once per player per game. Once per player per game. Can you walk a player without pitches? Can you still intentionally walk players all the other times? Absolutely, but you're going to have to pitch to them. Okay. That wraps up the first uh, session. So, do you have any questions? Any and all questions? Yes? I have a question about the leagues. Um, you said that they are allowed, but the screen said that they are not allowed. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, there's a question you, about the beads. Beads are allowed. Jim, can you repeat the question? Yeah. The question, well, it was a misunderstanding of a, of a word. So it's all good. We allow beads. Other questions? Jim, what about um, coaches warming up uh, pitchers and fields? You mentioned regular season and all-stars. Yes. So uh, maybe some of you aren't familiar. TOCs is our tournament of champions. It lasts about a week. It comes right after the end of the season. Winners of uh, each league and their division will play in TOCs. TOCs is considered an extension of regular season, so therefore in TOCs you will be able to warm up your pitchers. It'll only be in the All-Stars that you cannot. Is there another question? Steve. I must have misunderstood. I thought Little League was no longer publishing rule books. Am I wrong? Paper rule books. Uh, they, uh, so the question is, is Little League still publishing paper rule books? They are. They have a limited number, though. They're encouraging the app. Okay, Ed? Thank you, You're welcome. Good. Turn it off. Now you did it. There we are. Go back here. All right. Let me do the regulations. So, as Jim said, my name is Ed Newbegin, and I'm a member of the District Four training staff. And the first thing I want to do before we get started is ask, how many of you are doing this managing or coaching thing for the first time? Congratulations. It's quite a ride. I did it there for a while myself, and then I became an umpire, and just, just you know, the world got so much better. I'm waiting on my shoes. <laughs> so we're trying to get you prepared here so that when we have interactions with you out on the field, uh, at the very least, you can ask us coherent questions instead of having a misunderstanding of the rules. So we'll move forward with that. Here we are in, in the regulations. Mandatory play. It's actually gotten a lot easier this year due to a, the rule for continuous batting. Each rostered player at the start of the game has to have one at bat and a minimum of six defensive outs. That means any player at all who shows up for your game, and when, the, when do, are they considered to have been, what is the start of the game? 
The start of the game is when you present your lineup cards to the umpire. As soon as that happens, anyone who's on those lineup cards is considered to have started that game. If you have a player that shows up a little bit later, you can choose whether or not to add them to that lineup. If you do, mandatory play will have to be observed. All right? So just remember that. If they show up in the second or third inning, that's going to put you in a bit of a bind. So there's no exceptions for any shortened games, including run rule and darkness. That means if you have any players who haven't met minimum play and a game is called for darkness, or uh, you've been run ruled uh, as early as the third inning or so, you have to keep track of those players and they must start either the, they must go to the completion, have the man mandatory play if you complete that game later, and they also must start the next regular game and complete mandatory play then before they can be substituted, okay? Let's talk about what, a, what an at-bat means. Little League has been very specific about that in the last couple of years because some managers have been taking advantage of the single at-bat by letting the poor kid get out there, take a walk, and then immediately subbing them out. So Little League wants to see them, since they may only have that one at-bat during the game, uh, they want to see them have the full experience. In this case, they are considered a batter until they've either been put out as a batter, struck out or whatever, um, retired in uh, a play, a pop-up, fly ball, uh, reaches first base and subsequently scores or is on base when the third out of the inning occurs. At that point, the requirement for that single at-bat is fulfilled. So that's something you need to keep track of as well. You cannot substitute or remove that uh, player during that any, at any time during that first at-bat except for injury, of course. So the, you can see that you can't do that. Uh, six defensive outs. You're not required to do those consecutively anymore. They just have to add up to six total outs in the game. So if somebody starts, doesn't have enough, comes back in, gets substituted for, and comes, well, there's no substitutes, it's continuous batting order. So when you substitute another player in, if you do it before one of your starters has gotten uh, six outs uh, when you're starter defensive, you have to make sure that that starter gets a total of six. And they don't, so they don't have to be consecutive outs. In the minors, um, that the, the question has come up before, so you have five run innings. Um, if you get to a five run inning and everyone's retired, even though an actual out hasn't been reported, that is considered for the purpose of the rule as being three outs. So before the game starts, this is something that we, the, the situation where the umpires are, have first um, enter the field, we're usually there about a half hour earlier, so half hour, 20 minutes early. What we want to see is on that field, inside the fence, only managers, coaches, players, and us. The Little League feels that we don't need to have a whole circus out there with parents, siblings, things like that. Makes your job a little easier too because there's less people to, to uh, keep track of. Uh, only three adults per team are allowed <coughs> in warm-ups, uh, during warm-ups. That's, that's at this time before the game. Non-competitive minors in T-ball can have four adults. Uh, you, so you can, you can have your three rostered adults and then you can bring in one of the team moms or dads to help out. Honestly, you know, with T-ball, they're not too worried that you're, that there's gonna be, actually you're gonna need that many adults most times in T-ball just to keep them all corralled. Um, interleague minors, though, uh, by interleague rules, this is the difference right here, the interleague minors only allow you to have three adults. Players, any player who's holding or near a swinging bat, or bats at all, must wear a batting helmet in warm-ups. And we'll see a video in just a moment that uh, shows you why that's so important. During a game, only players, managers, and coaches in the dugout. Again, we don't need siblings and parents wandering in and out asking if Johnny wants a snack and things like that. They need to have, you need to emphasize to your parents that all that has to happen before the game starts. Make sure that all those snacks that are required if there's some sort of emergency that requires the child to be to, to be cared for by an adult, um, problems with uh, insulin or something like that, have the coach contact the, the parents out there and, and, and remove the player from the dugout and have them tend to them out there. Um, an adult coach or manager has to be in the dugout at all times. This is for, for monitoring a couple of things, making sure that your players are paying attention, that they're not wandering out, that nobody's coming in who's unauthorized, and something that's a, a kind of a bug for us, nobody in that uh, dugout should be picking up bats you know, on the offensive side until it's their turn to bat. 
make sure the bats stay in the racks. We don't need any accidents in there because they don't, may not have any control of it and nobody in that uh, dugout other than them is wearing a helmet. The players can only be on the field, in the dugout, or in the bullpen. In wandering around, you never know what's going to happen. In your local games, everyone feels nice and comfortable, but you know, few kids disappear from their own front yard sometimes. So let's just make sure they stay there. That also keeps the, the, the uh, players focused on the game. So you see us in the field, everything's been cool. So we're gonna come out and inspect your gear. We're gonna ask that you have that gear out in front. That's gonna be helmets, bats, and uh, just the catcher's helmets. And you don't have to have the full catcher's gear out there. Um, things like straps on their uh, shin guards and on their vest, we just assume that you're gonna keep those in good repair uh, so that they can actually wear them. But catcher's helmets, batting helmets, and bats should be out along the fence so that we can come by and inspect them before the game starts. This is what I'm talking about for the dangers of swinging a bat in the dugout. All right? Batman was wearing a helmet and he ended up having to get medical attention for, for getting smacked in the head like that. I saw it in a, a men's senior league baseball game that I was umpiring as well. That fellow caught one right between the eyes and uh, within a minute had a walnut on the middle of his forehead. Shoes, anything majors and below, have to have plastic cleats, nothing metal. You can't have an on-deck batter, but when you go on offense, your, your teams come off the field, you're in there, the first player that's due up is allowed to take a bat and come outside the dugout with it. We ask that you keep them away from the plate so that they don't get hit by an errant pitch. We also ask that you not allow them to cross behind the, the catcher and go to the other side. That territory is for the other team. And we don't need anybody being smacked again by an errant pitch. So they need to stay where they can swing a bat safely away from you as well. You might be outside the dugout talking with your man other managers and coaches. So that, but they can stay there and wait until they're called by the umpire to come into the batter's box. Um, metal cleats and on-deck batters are allowed in juniors and seniors, that's baseball and softball. If you want to draw a batting circle, that's fine. Make sure it as well is safely away from both people coming and going from the dugout and far enough away from the plate that they don't interfere with the warm-ups in between. So you're allowed to have one during the game. There's somebody at bat and there's somebody standing in the batter circle. Also, <coughs> if they're too close to the uh, plate, we don't need any foul balls coming at them in too short a time them not to be able to react. Jewelry, um, I know you, that you, if you're watching any of the college games, you see that those ladies are just, you know, uh, they, they're, they're practically a jewelry store, some of them. Well, Little League wants to avoid liability by not allowing any sorts of jewelry at all, except for medical alert uh, bracelets and necklaces. If your player is wearing one of those, needs one of those, it should, on the wrist, it, it should be covered or taped down with something like surgical tape. Um, it can be covered with a wristband as well. If it's on the, if it's a necklace, a simple piece of uh, surgical tape across just above where the pendant of it is to keep it on, fastened onto the chest so it doesn't come out of their shirt is adequate. Helmets. In softball, you're not required to have cages on the front of the helmets, but if you do, we're gonna be checking the screws. So all these attachment screws here, we're gonna check them to make sure first that they're present. If you're missing a screw, we're gonna ask you to either find one and install it, or we're gonna take that helmet out. It has to be properly attached. It has to be to factory specs. Um, if there's a loose screw, here's a, here's a clue. Bring, have yourself a little Phillips head screwdriver as part of your kit. Uh, so many times we'll hand it to, and they're, and they're looking for dimes tighten the thing down, just a little Phillips head screwdriver that, that you have access to, because those will come loose, even the best of them will. So have that ready, and we say it's loose, boom, it's done, now it's legal. Um, if you have a helmet without uh, a face guard, all these helmets we're gonna be checking them for any kind of defects, but if you have one without a face guard, we may uh, check to make sure that we're not getting any cracks right through here. That's the first place that they usually do happen. And all of them have to have this stamp right here, the Noxy stamp, uh, in, embossed on the back. Make sure we don't cover that up. Anything that covers that up voids the warranty. Not just covering that up, but here are some examples of helmets that are gonna get tossed. 
the upper left there, that's, been, that's one that's been repainted, perhaps in your team colors or something like that. That voids the warranty on those, voids the, and once that's done, it's, in, it's <coughs> illegal to use and a potential danger to your player. Um, anything that has uh, custom stickers and things like that on, on it, that's also gonna uh, be tossed because it voids, also voids the uh, warranty uh, from the manufacturer. If it didn't come like that from to, to you, if it wasn't like that in the store, then it's not gonna be allowed in the game. There will be, a, a, on occasion, you might wanna have, if you have two identical helmets and you need to know whose is whose, and you've got something like a little um, Avery sticker or something on the back that has somebody's name or a number on it, chances are we're just gonna look the other way on that because that's that we don't really consider that a decorative sticker so much. Chrome helmets have been illegal ever since they first came out. And fortunately, we haven't had anybody who's tried to use one. So, but for purposes of this, if anyone comes to you with a chrome helmet, tell them it's time to get a refund. Catcher's helmets. There are two different styles here. We've got the traditional one here. And also, I want to talk about batter's helmets. We are going to be checking your pads on that, too. If you have any pads that are detached or so worn out that they look like rats have been munching at them, chances are good that we're going to kick that one as well. So if you can take a quick look at some of your uh, the ladies' uh, batting helmets to make sure that those pads are at least well attached and in, and in decent shape. Same here with the catcher's helmets, we'll check that padding. We'll do the same thing with the, uh, with the cage as well, uh, making sure that those screws are all present and uh, tightly done. And both styles here require a throat guard. Now throat guards, most of them come from the manufacturer with either the Velcro type uh, attachments or with uh, leather, the leather strings, like this one here. Those are fine, and we'll be checking those to make sure that they're in good repair. Every now and then when those things have worn out, I've seen uh, some coaches use zip ties. Zip ties are okay, but I have to warn you that because they're made of plastic and sometimes you use the little thin ones, um, they wear out really quickly. I've seen more than one time where uh, the elements, whether it's gotten too hot and what have you, they're just too old, it wears out. And you get that kind of impact on there and they break. So unless you can uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely have, it's your only choice, try to avoid using a zip ties. Those uh, other uh, attachments are much safer. Just I mean, use some leather shoelaces, that's gonna be even safer than the zip ties. So you will be required to have that and they have to be, it has to be dangling. The definition of dangling is it has to swing freely and not be too far down on the chest that it doesn't provide protection for the throat. Typically, we'll say about two fingers. So about two fingers down from here so it can swing freely but can still protect the neck. Taking, batting pra taking pitching practice without a helmet. Yeah, that's gonna be Then we'll, next we'll be checking your bats. Um, now a damaged, anything that's considered a defective bat is not illegal, but it is is unsafe. So if we hand it to you and say this, this is defective, honestly, let the, let the child's parents know, the player's parents know that it's just gonna get kicked over and over again. They might as well go out and invest in a new one because um, it might slip through, there might be some lapse moments where it's going to get through to the next game. But trust me, if you get to TOCs or All-Stars, one of us will see it, one of our staff will see it, and once again, it'll get kicked. Damaged means it'll be cracked, bent, dented, sharp edge. You'll see us holding it, rolling it between our hands, moving the hands up and down. We're feeling for dents. We're looking at it, we're examining it closely for cracks in it, because even a small crack uh, could end up being uh, very hazardous uh, during the game with the kind of pressures that are exerted on a bat when it hits a ball. A defective bat isn't considered illegal. We'll remove all of them from the game that we find and hand to you. What I'd uh, ask you to do, if we do show you some, during the regular season, we're just gonna give, give it to you and ask you to put it out of the way. Please just put it outside the dugout, give it to the parents, something like that. During All-Stars, if we find one, we ourselves present it to the tournament director and they put it in the score, in the score booth for you to uh, come back to later. If you abandon it there, that's probably for, for the best because you're in tournament now and it's gonna get kicked every time you try to put it out there. Trust me, we've seen it before. So, uh, and, and in this case here, 
the, the, this isn't protestable. If we find something we say this is defective, that bat doesn't enter the game. And why do we care so much? This is something I actually saw in a varsity game over at Akalani. And just like that, you'll see uh, in the next frame, we'll have a behind the batter view and just how far the end of that bat went. Fortunately, there was, this is just a practice, so nobody was out there to try to dodge this missile. Look at that. The one at the game I did, that varsity game I did, uh, it broke just like that and uh, landed halfway between the left fielder and the shortstop. <laughs> yeah, still. <laughs> No, well, that's not a that's not a hit, is it? Yeah, yeah, I balled in play. <laughs> All right, this is our own Shannon uh, self holding a bat that uh, broke in two. Uh, you'll see sometimes that with these two-piece bats like that, we'll hold it and and give it a bit of a movement. If we feel any give in it at all, we're going to call that a defective bat. Illegal bats. This is where some trouble could happen and actually did in a tournament game that we did. If we find a baseball bat, that's gone. Wrong sport. An altered bat. This one is kind of harder to tell, but if, we, if it looks like there's been anything done to it, like removing the end cap or something like that, if it's been rolled or frozen or something like that, there's some umpires that can tell, but this isn't travel ball, so I don't see as many of those. If it doesn't meet the length, diameter, or BPF specs, um, we'll go through those in just a moment. I'll have a, a, a slide that shows what the length, diameter, and BPF specs are for uh, majors and below and juniors and seniors. If a BPF is unreadable, uh, that you can show me two identical bats, and if one of them, the, the, the printed BPF on it has been scuffed out and it can't be read, that bat is, is out and it's considered illegal. Pine tar. I don't see a whole lot of that in softball, but don't, don't encourage your ladies to use any kind of gripping uh, uh, substance on their pine tar or similar adhesive. So these are the, this is the, the BPF mark. This is what we call a thumbprint. It's nice and big, very, very difficult to um, obscure. The one that we have problems with sometimes is the one up here. You can see on that one, on the reload, that 1.20 printed rather small. So there are times when even something like impact of the ball or when it gets thrown or something like that, it can get scuffed. So if that becomes illegible, again, you can show me two that are exactly the same, but if I can't read that one, two, zero, it's not in. Up until a few years ago, the 115 BPF was allowed along with the 120, that, but that was grandfathered out and now any bat that has the 115 on it is considered an illegal bat. Uh, some of you might have gotten those. If you have players that have an older sister who might have played five, ten years ago and handed that bat down, just make sure that that bat isn't um, brought into the game. We'll, we'll, we will try to remove that again in inspection. We don't want any uh, penalties to happen. Let's talk about that. The bat dimensions, very simple. All softball bats are two and a quarter in diameter. Majors and minors, 33 inches long. Juniors and seniors, 34 inches long. Simple as that. If juniors and seniors, somebody wants to use a 33 inch bat, that's fine. We just don't want the maximum length uh, of, the, of it to be more than 34 or 33 in meters and below. So this is the use of an illegal bat. The using uh, an illegal bat is qualified as taking one, putting one foot into the batter's box. So if that, if that player is approaching the batter's box and you notice and say, wait a minute, I removed that bat already, take the bat and now this time it has to be completely removed all right so she there's no penalty is involved at this point but you're going to tell them get this bat out of here and I don't want to see it again if she does get into the batter's box a couple of things can happen if a play occurs using that bat and it's discovered before the next batter comes up and steps into the batter's box um, if a play happens if the uh, defensive manager can choose whether to take the result of the play or, or, or the penalty. The, the penalty is that the batter will be declared out and no runs will score and for the first violation the team will lose an adult base coach. That's not an ejection, 
What that means is that if you had two adults as base coaches, one of them now will have to be in the dugout, and when you're on the defense, there'll be one adult and one player as base coaches. That's for the whole rest of the game. Upon the second violation, the manager will be ejected, and any subsequent ones, but come on, after the first one, check your bats. Please be aware of the bats that your players are using. Uh, we are the last line when we inspect it. You're the first line. Um, batting donuts, those have been uh, illegal in Little League for, uh, in every division forever. You are allowed to use the sleeves, however, so no batting donuts at all. Okay, any questions on these? Yes? At the um, um, batter at halfing, coaches are allowed to speak to that batter at, at, their, at their on deck spot? Of course. Okay. Yeah, no so problem at all. Have on deck. Of course. Well, I mean, the, that first, I mean, if, if you're in majors, the, he's, allowed to be out of the, he's allowed to be out of the dugout, so yeah, your coach can talk to him. During that time when you're in between innings like that, make sure even then that you have at least one in the dugout. I've seen a lot of times when the manager and both coaches will come out and have a little powwow out here. Meanwhile, all heck's breaking loose in the, in the dugout. Let's just make sure at least somebody's in there monitoring that. Anything else? Yes, sir. So the same. Yeah, exactly. Mass or throw guards required? Yes. All, all catcher's mass of any type, the bucket and the regular. Okay. And then field masks, is there a problem with speakers? Well, there's not a whole lot of those out there. You know, uh, the the field, those little those, those same little apply to field. Yeah, don't paint the don't paint the cage. Yeah, I'd say anything that but that the, the what we come down to about any kind of equipment is if it didn't uh, have it on there when you bought it, don't put anything else. Yes. Um, if we only have two coaches and no manager, does that mean only one coach out on the field? And then one of them has to. So can we have a player out? Yes. Okay. You can have a player as a base coach. Okay. Yeah, you're allowed to do that. Um, I, I'd always encourage, since I understand you're going to be some of, the, some of the younger kids, just tell them to pay attention. You know, a lot of times with the young, especially the younger players, they'll be looking all around while the players at bat. I will, as a field umpire, I'll stop the game and say, "Young lady, please pay attention." <laughs> Anything else? Ed, that player that's in the coach's box, though, they need to wear a helmet. Oh yeah, well, they need to wear a helmet. Yeah, thank you, Phil. Okay? All right. Take it away, Jim. Thank you. So just a very quick suggestion. All you managers and coaches have a practice very soon where you have all your players bring whatever bats, helmets they're going to use, and you go through them. You go through them and inspect them. Look for the ones that are ripped, the, the you know, internal, everything that Ed said. And if you know they are illegal or damaged, tell that player, sorry, do not ever bring this to another practice or game. It seems to be an emergency vehicle. We're all good here, right? Not here. <laughs> okay. Uh, usually we save this towards the end, but I wanted to go through it earlier because these are our interleague rules, okay? So, as I said before, we're playing by book rules. However, there are those rules which uh, a league is given a choice. So if you're playing interleague, these are the rules. If by chance you're playing both interleague and games within your own league, Find out what you're going to do within your own league. I know Walnut Creek, for example, their majors team is gonna play interleague. Well, in their in-house games between two Walnut Creek teams, they're just gonna go by the interleague rules, correct? There's a little bit of a change, Jim, but we'll talk about uh -huh. it. <laughs> okay. So interleague games will be played by the official Little League playing rules. And in the following areas, we are going to go through where local options are allowed. We will talk about what our interleague rules will be. If you want a copy of the interleague rules, there's one for AA, AAA, majors, and seniors. It's at this website, which is the California District 4 website. Go there. Click on the softball 
and that that'll take you to a page that'll have all the interleague rules, all the interleague schedules, and also the interleague contact lists. Okay, let's start with pitching. So we're going to start with uh, minors. This is double A and triple A. Pitchers in double A and triple A, all this is interleague, are limited to three innings in a game. Only three innings. What we're trying to do here, create more pitchers, give more girls the opportunity to pitch. There is no limit, uh, no days of rest when they can pitch again, even if they go three innings. Uh, maximum innings per week, well, since it's three innings in a game and they're not playing do double headers, you know, 21, but that's never going to be reached. So know that your player, they pitch one game, they can pitch the next game. There's no limitations whatsoever, except, whoa, except that they have three, um, uh, three in, uh, innings per game. I will talk in a minute about back-to-back uh, -back games. It's not relevant for minors. No 12-year-old may pitch in double or triple A. No 12-year-old may pitch in double or triple A. Okay, majors. Majors, this is different than book rules. So if you go to regulation six and you go through that, regulation, you'll find that it's different than this. Again, what are we concerned about? Creating more pitchers, so we limit the pitching a little bit here. So, um, number of innings they can pitch in a game, 12 innings. So hopefully you're not gonna go a 12 inning game, but your player can pitch the whole game if they want. Um, one day of rest is required if they pitch more than six innings. That's just a calendar day. Pitch on Monday, over six innings, can't pitch Tuesday, uh, they can pitch Wednesday. Maximum number of innings per week, no limit in majors, no limit. Now, innings a pitcher can pitch in back-to-back -back games. If in the first game, they pitch four or fewer innings, they are not limited at all in the next game, except for they can only pitch up to 12 innings. However, if they pitch five or more innings, they can only pitch four innings, up to four innings in the next game, okay? What do we mean by back-to-back -back games? Back-to-back -back games means the next played game. So this doesn't matter if the back-to-back -back games are on Monday and Tuesday or are on Monday and the following Sunday, that is a back-to-back -back game. So no, in majors, anytime your pitcher pitches five or more innings, the next game they can only pitch up to four. Umpires, We'll greet you at home plate, we will exchange lineups, and we will ask you, do you have any pitching restrictions? This is exactly what we're looking for. And you'll announce to us, oh yeah, I had, you know, Alyssa, and she pitched this many innings, so she's limited to four. We need to know that at the beginning of the game. Seniors, they can pitch 12 innings in a game, no days of rest required, no limits for how many they pitch in a week. Remember, these are seven inning games for seniors. Once again, five innings or less, they can pitch up to 12 innings the next played game. If they go six or more innings, they can only pitch no more than five. Again, why are we doing this? Developing more pitchers' arms. And again, back to back, it's the next play game. So when we have that meeting at home play, make sure you alert us if there are any restrictions on your pitchers. Okay. Number of <laughs> players. Interleague. You can start a game, continue a game, and end a game with eight players. What do you do the ninth batting spot? You just simply skip over it. It is not an out. 
We have time limits for interleague games. We don't want them to go on forever. And a lot of times on Saturdays, we have games stacked up. So we need to have some kind of time limit. What are those time limits? Hour and 45 for minors and two hours for majors and seniors. What does a time limit mean? It's not a drop dead. What a time limit is, is that no new inning may be started after that time limit is hit. If an inning has begun before the time limit hits, you simply complete that uh, inning. So if we get to 205, you cannot start a new inning. Tie games will not be replayed at that point at a later date. It's just too hard to get two teams together again and then try to get that game in and then another game in after that. All games that are decided by a time limit, no matter how many innings, are considered a regulation game. Okay, majors and minors. We are using a continuous batting order in majors and minors, double AA, A, triple A, and majors. A continuous batting order means all the players who show up are starters, all the players are in that batting order. You simply bat through the complete order. If you have 14 players, you bat through 14, and then you start again at the top. You can do free substitutions on defense with a continuous batting order. That means that you can have a player play one inning in defense, next inning they can sit on the bench. Next inning they play defense, next inning they sit on the bench. The only thing that matters is make sure they get those six defensive outs in. Uh, what if a player in a continuous batting order can't continue, injured, injured, sick, or has to leave? You simply skip over that batting order spot. It is not an out. If that player is able to come back, they simply go back into the batting order spot that they were originally. What do you do in continuous batting order if you have an injured runner? Hits the ball, trips over first base, is safe, but uh, you know rolls their ankle. You get the player who made the last out will be the substitute runner for the continuous batting order. Seniors is different. Seniors will use bat nine. In other words, nine players are in the batting order. Everybody else is a substitute and sits on the bench until the substitutes then come in for the starters. A substitute has to then meet mandatory play, and only then can a starter re-enter, but in the exact same spot in the batting order. So that's how we're gonna do seniors. If you have a senior team, please go to rule 303 and read that through in terms of substitutions. Minors. We are not gonna use a courtesy runner. No courtesy runner is used for minors. We will be using a courtesy runner for majors and seniors. What is a courtesy runner? Courtesy runner is a runner who can run for the pitcher or catcher of record. When we say of record, it means whoever pitched or caught that last defensive inning. That's the pitcher or catcher of record and there must be two outs. Who is the player that's gonna run for them? In majors, it's the player who made the last out. In seniors, it's the player, it's a player who's not in the batting order. And I know we're, we're just, we're throwing information at you people. A lot of information. So remember, this is gonna get recorded you will be able to go to YouTube and you'll be able to rewatch this and look for different areas um, that you were a little bit unclear about. Okay, special pinch runner will not be allowed in minors or majors. Why? Because we're using continuous batting order. It will be used in seniors. It can be used once per inning. Foot in the batter's box. 
not enforced in minors will be enforced in majors and seniors. Uncaught third strike, not used in minors. It will be used in majors and seniors. It will be enforced. Stealing of signs. There's a specific rule about stealing of signs. It will not be enforced in minors. It will be enforced in majors and seniors. This is a player or manager or coach who steals the signs of the other team and tries to alert the batter of the location of a pitch. The rule is the first time it happens, there'll be a warning. Second time it happens, whoever does it will be ejected. Protests. Try not to have protests. You know, these are interleague games, um, and the standings aren't being kept. You don't keep the standings for for the interleagues, right? No, only the cities that have their own group of teams keep track of their win loss records for TFC purposes. Yeah. So it's only going to be the, you know, your league that's going to keep track of this stuff. Interleague's not going to. So you can file protests. What can you file protests over? Only interpretation of a plain rule. And that has to be, that protest has to be done before the next pitch play or play. Or an ineligible pitcher or player. How do you do a protest? You tell the umpire. I'm protesting this game because of this you this player shouldn't have been pitching and then after the game you need to email Phil Rains there is his uh, email address you have to email them within 24 hours two days if it's a Saturday game he will then decide on the protest his decision final okay most of you from when I asked earlier are here for AA and AAA. We don't have any particular rules beyond what we've gone through for majors and seniors. So now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna talk about AAA and AA, okay? Because these two levels have rules that are different from the rule book. And so that's why we need to go through these. Okay, in minors, a half inning is three defensive outs or five runs are scored. And as Ed mentioned earlier, if you have five runs, that's equivalent to three defensive outs. The sixth and subsequent innings are unrestricted runs. Now, a lot of times folks think, oh, the this is the last inning we're gonna play. We're only gonna get four innings in today. So the fourth inning, we're gonna do unlimited runs, no. It is only unlimited for the six or any subsequent any we get rid of that five run rule only nine players are allowed on defense this is not t-ball regulation game is two innings i guarantee you you'll probably and you should and you better get more than two innings in in one of these games but early in the season in a double a game it could get it can be maybe a little bit difficult, but a two inning game is regulation in minors. Yes. Just real quick on that two inning deal. Um, it could happen because if you play a game on a weeknight or something and you're in the second inning, you finished it, and all of a sudden you got a down four, it's gonna be an official game no matter what, what the score is after that point. So it could happen in that scenario. Yep. So it reverts back to the inning before. Oh, we should have won last week. <laughs> 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 Good question. <laughs> We're finding out something about our managers and coaches <laughs> today. Okay, outfielders remain in outfield until ball is hit. Um, know that it, an outfield is not necessarily defined by the grass. If uh, your players are playing up at Hidden Lakes upper field in Martinez, I can tell you, you're not gonna wanna place those double-A players out on the grass because they won't even be able to see home home plate they won't be able to see the batter they'll be so far out there so just because it's grass that doesn't mean that's where the outfield starts umpire will judge what's reasonable here 
Okay, recommended, recommended that a pitcher hits three batters in an inning or five in a game, that pitcher is replaced. That's only recommended. If for whatever reason the umpire believes there's a really unsafe issue here because your pitcher is uh, hitting every single player in the head, that, that pitcher is probably gonna say, hey, why don't you remove that pitcher from the mound so I don't have to, okay? Um, but again, do you really want a bunch of girls hit by pitches? No, you don't, so remove the player. Okay, double A. No bunts in the first half of the season. No bunts in the first half of the season. No bunts ever when an adult is pitching. No stealing of bases is allowed. First half and the second half of the, ceiling, uh, the season. Double A, no stealing. No walks are allowed. We'll talk about what you do if you actually get four balls on the batter. In AAA, no bunts or steals when an adult pitches. Otherwise, you can bunt and you can steal. Except that in the first half of the season, in AAA, you can only advance one base on a steal. So you try to steal from first to second, there's an overthrow of second, your player has to stand there on second. They can't run to third. Um, Double A pitching, first half of the season, adult pitch only. So you managers and coaches of double A, start working on your pitching, okay? You don't wanna embarrass yourself and you don't wanna embarrass your kids because you can get your kids out because you can't pitch one. Well. Um, and pitch from 35 feet. 35 feet is where uh, the pitching rubber is for minors, 35 minors. 40 in majors, 43 in seniors. Okay, double A. The second half of the season begins April 22nd. Write that date down. Your rules will change come 22nd of April, okay? So, the second half of the season, you are going to have kid pitch and the kid will pitch to a batter until they strike out that batter, the batter hits a fair ball, or there are four balls on the batter. If you get to that point of four balls on the batter, we're not gonna have walks, remember? So you bring in your adult. Have either your first or your third base coach come out to do that. Don't have your manager come out from the dugout because then what do you have? No adult in the dugout, okay? And then that adult will pitch. If there's been four balls or the batter was hit by a pitch, the adult will pitch until the batter strikes out, the existing count, they take over from the kid, um, hits a fair ball, or the adult pitches five pitches, um, and at that point, it's over unless the fifth pitch is fouled off. That's why you adults work on your pitcher pitching, okay? Triple A pitching, first half of the season, kid pitch, okay? First half of the season, kid pitch. Pitch and tell, same thing as before. The player is struck out, the player hits a fair ball, or if bases are loaded, four balls to the batter or a batter is hit, only then will the adult come in. So what does that mean? That means that in AAA, you can walk a batter. Kid pitches four balls to a batter, they walk. The only thing is we're not gonna walk in runs. So bases loaded, four balls to the batter or batter's hit, now we're gonna bring in the adult. Same thing. Pitches until the batter strikes out, ball is hit fair, or five pitches, providing that the fifth is not fouled off. Second half of the season, Triple A, same thing, begins April 22nd, know that date. Then it's only kid pitch and runs may be walked in. The second half of Triple A, 
is softball. No matter how poorly your pitchers are pitching, it's going to be softball. Okay, that's everything for interleague rules. Questions? Yes, Shannon. We're not doing the batting order for uh, half inning, so it's just three outs or five runs. Okay, so Shannon is asking, there is a local option in Little League where you can have in minors, the, it's either three outs or five runs, or you bat completely through your batting order, and then the inning ends. We do not do that batting through the order in interleague, mostly because we have two teams that may have a different number of players. Yes, Shannon. You had mentioned that uh, the 35 foot for the pitching for the coach. Can you talk a little bit about that? We want to make sure that the coach is stepping on the pitching plate when they pitch and not at the chalk circle. Do we care? Do we... Yeah. So what this is saying, he's asking about the, the coach pitch from 35 feet. So that's where the pitching rubber is. Um, we're not going to hold the coach to, you know, softball rules about, you know, dragging their feet and everything. But what we want them to is to be at that distance. We want the players to get used to a pitch coming to them from that distance. We also don't want the coaches to come up and get so close that they're pitching like this and they get a line drive in their face um, and become part of the play. So, yes. Yes, back there. Okay. Jim, please define the hit by pitch. All right, so I'm coaching double A. Okay. Right? Did this last year. We had an umpire who said hit by pitch was a ball where the pitcher literally rolled it and the batter could have gotten out of the way, but she didn't and it hit her foot. That's a hit by pitch? Or are we talking she should have gotten out of the way versus an ear hole? Okay. So the question is about what is a hit by pitch? Anytime the pitch hits uh, the player's physical being or any part of their uniform or shoe, there is a rule that the batter must make a reasonable effort to get out of the way of a pitch. How do we decide a reasonable effort? I, if I'm umpiring a senior level, uh, I'm expecting a different level than from a double A player who might be so petrified standing there batting that they don't even see the ball and they can't even move. Uh, but if the ball is rolling towards them and they're sort of watching it come at them, <laughs> point, I'm going to make them stay in the batter's box. I'm just going to call a ball. And leave the kid pitching. <laughs> it's only recommended, remember, it's only recommended. It's only recommended. Yes? Okay, so she's asking about slap hitting. Um, or will you cover that with your butt? Do you want to go through that with your butt? I will. Okay, he'll go through that and actually physically demonstrate that. Okay, but you can't have a foot outside um, the <coughs> batter's box on the ground hit the ball. You can't have a foot. If you hit the ball, you can't have a foot completely outside the batter's box on the ground. That's going to be an illegally batted ball and the batter will be out. It can be in the air. Exactly, at the point of contact. There's another, you, we'll um, go here. Yeah, for the seniors, you said they're batting nine, no continuance, right? Correct. Can that be a local rule, though, that you can do continuance, or can the team be like agree to that? Okay, good question. Uh, so, in senior, can you make a manager's agreement? No manager agreements are allowed in interleague uh, softball. So it has to be bat nine. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, the first slide you said a rule change about seniors. There's no minimum to make an all star team. Correct. What's to stop Anol or Walling Creek or Martinez from grabbing some senior kids at the end of the year out of that stud all star team and just running the tables? Uh, what's to 
question? The, the question is, because there's no mandatory, there's no, in, in two ways, there's the, a player doesn't need to play a mandatory number of games, and the team doesn't need to play a mandatory number of games. What keeps a team from just grabbing a bunch of uh, high school girls and forming a team? Is that your question? Or, I mean, they can or be any, 13 year old tw uh, travel right. ball kids. Right. Whatever. Yeah, what's to stop them? Nothing. So, how is this? And nothing consider? pretty much has stopped them. Okay. Just know that this is. Well, I don't want to go into that. I'm not going to go into that. But no, <laughs> nothing really stops them. Okay. Okay. Jim, I got something to say. So earlier we talked about the um, pitching restrictions and seniors and majors. If you go to the, and this is just for seniors and majors, you go to the uh, District Four website and you go under softball. At the bottom of the page, there's a little link there that says pitching login form. You guys need to have that in your binder and present it every game at home plate just to show that you're pitching from your last game. So there's no questions, no animosity. It's right there, plain as day. You can see his, he can see yours. And then you go to present your lineup cards to the umpires before every game. Bring your pitching log with you so there's no questions. Um, we don't want anything going on where, you know, things you hear anyway. But pitching. If I can make like a like a 30 second uh, comment on the that last question too it's not just grabbing any old people and going out and playing they still have to uh, be properly um, uh, they have to be part of the league that they're representing so they have to have all the proper registration and everything they have to be a bona fide they have to be bona fide a residence uh, residency so you can't pick somebody from Pittsburgh and somebody from Concord and somebody from, no, it has, they all have to be within those league boundaries, have to be able to prove that and have all that um, uh, documentation with them when they show up at their first All-Star game. If they don't, they're kicked. Any player who doesn't is kicked. Okay, so let's talk about the bunt in softball because it has different uh, requirements to it than it does in baseball. Um, Mr. Petrus, could you come up and help me out here? <coughs> So in softball, as the as the ball is coming in and the, the player turns and squares around for a bunt, first of all, as an umpire, the first thing I'm glancing down at is their feet to make sure that they're still in the box. As the pitch comes in, as it approaches the bat, if she draws the bat away as the as the ball approaches, I can I only judge at that point whether it's in the strike zone or not. I don't consider that a swing. It can be as close, come on up and stop. It can be as close as an inch away from the bat. But if she follows it back as it goes, if, go ahead, she follows it back like that and makes no actual physical attempt at it, then that's gonna be, that's gonna, that's gonna be only judged on whether it's in the zone or not. Now, if the same thing happens and she's out like so, underneath, if you, and she's like this and it just passes it and then she draws it back, as soon as it breaks this plane, that's an attempt. And I'm going to call that a strike, regardless of where the where the ball is. We all get that? Okay. Now, the one one last thing: as it approaches, she may offer and then go back like this, a little flick and back like that. That is an attempt at the ball. If she does any forward motion at all and then draws it back, and I don't care if it's ten feet in front of the plate, she's offered at it, and I'm going to call that a strike on a swing. Thank you, sir. We had talked about slap hitting. That's not slapping is not considered a bunt. The player runs forward and makes basically a, a weak swing to direct the ball somewhere. That's just considered a regular uh, regular bat. If she misses it, it's a strike. If she and it, even if it's um, and if she you know she fouls it off with two strikes, that's just a foul ball. Double first base. Um, do you all know whether uh, your league is using double first bases this year? <laughs> Got a show of hands on that? Okay. All right, just we're going to go over this real quickly. Um, plays being made on a runner at first base, we're talking about a routine play, or in some cases, like if the, if a, the outfielder tries to put her out before the batter runner, before she gets to the base. Any plays being made on a runner going to first base, 
the defense has to use the white section. The, the first base uh, player has to be on that white, in contact with the white base, and the offense must use the orange section. All right. The, if the runner uses the white portion, she may be put out prior to, re to returning to the white section. We're going to have a video on this later. I'll describe it more in, in more detail there. Um, it, it's an appeal play. Let me just say real quickly on anything by the rule that's considered an appeal play, we do not, as an umpire, signal in any way that an infraction has occurred. This is where we depend on you or your players to notice that something's amiss, all right? And you, and you learn how to do a proper appeal play. Balls to the outfield, extra base hits, no plays on the runner. The runner can use either the white or the orange section as she passes the base. So a hit out there into the gap, she, she's running by first base, she can touch either the white or the orange and is considered to have touched that base. So if you think she missed it because she hit the orange instead of the white, incorrect. That whole base is live and okay for her to touch as she passes. Now, she passes by, decides to return. If they try to try to uh, double her or get uh, throw in behind her, she has to return to the white base in that, in that uh, section. Basically, once she passes the base, the orange base disappears. Now, on any uncaught third strike, the fielder and runner can switch. All right, so now the, she's, she's um, standing there and the, the ball gets by or the catcher drops it, the batter runner takes off her first base, she can go to either the white or the orange base. This is in order to let the fielder use either side of it to field a throw that's coming from behind the runner. It also happens on pass balls. She can, so in that situation where, that, uh, where the catcher is, trying to, is throwing from behind her to try to put her out, the batter runner can go to either the white or the orange base based on where she sees the defensive player playing. This one's going to be the potential play at first. Now, we're, now anytime there's a, there's a, you've got that double base and you've got a player who runs to that bag, it wouldn't hurt your somebody in your dugout to just make sure that she steps on the right one. <coughs> Get her. She say, you see, she only touched the white. Now, from the point where she touches that bag until she returns to it, that player can appeal. Right at this point, she could say, "Hey, she missed the bag," and hold up the ball as she's touching it, and that umpire should rule an out. But it has to be pretty quick in this case, as you can see. Here's an uncaught third strike. This is where the player in the fielder can switch bags if they need to because it's coming from behind her. You see, if she had to throw to the white, she'd conquer, even though she's running properly in the running lane. So they get to switch bags in that case for safety's sake. That's why they call it the safety bag as well, safety base. Once again, returning to the white base and Jim, we gotta, we gotta find one where the, where the umpire's paying more attention. There are gonna be a couple of clips in here where we, we don't look great. <laughs> and this is the first one. Because we're human too, right? This guy, great, he's right on top of it. Hey, safe, she got, she got back. Now she's standing on the orange base. Pitcher notices, tags her. Hey, what about this? Yeah, she should be. Let's take another look. <laughs> From a different angle. Quick set. Okay, so she's safe there. Good call. He's watching it, he's watching it, he's watching it. Okay, time for a nap. Oh. Yeah, beautiful. All right, let's go on with this. Yes. A quick question. You video, you had a picture that was wearing sunglasses in softball. Is there the same rule that pitchers cannot be wearing sunglasses? I don't recall that there is a regulation against the sunglasses. Not prescription. There, are, there are no regulations in baseball or softball about pitchers wearing glasses. The only thing is if the umpire believes they're reflective and distracting to the batter, yeah, like the, the chrome umpire style. is not removed. Yeah, the chrome style that might be reflective. We don't want to spend too much time on it. Yes, sir? No clarification on the uncut third strike. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, the defense gets to pick the base they're using. Right. The runner has to 
go to the opposite base, whatever base the... That's what I said. So the, as the runner is approaching the bag, she has to see where the defensive right. player is set up, and she, may, and she will go to the other, she'll go to the opposite bag. All right, pitching. A legal pitching delivery. We're going to have a, a diagram just after this, so I'm going to run right through it. Positioning in the feet, the pivot foot. Everybody know what the pivot foot is? What's the pivot foot? It's the, it's the side that she pitches with. So if she's a right-handed pitcher, the pivot foot is her right foot. The pivot foot has to be within or partially within the pitcher's plate. So you've got 24 inches there. So it has to be within the boundaries of that, either completely or partially. So she can be partially stepping. And it has to be on top, the foot has to be on top of the plate. If your pitcher approaches the pitching plate and her pivot foot is has the heel against it, that is not a legal delivery. That's that's contact with it in but not legal contact. She has to step back and have that heel. So it's specifically written into the rule on top of the plate. That's the pivot foot. The non-pivot foot can be on the plate as well or behind it, but it also has to be within the confines of that 24 inches or partially within it. So if I'm looking from behind, I'm going to see at least half of that foot in line with the edge of the pitching plate. Shoulders aligned with first and third bases, so in other words, she's square to the plate. Hands separated when she's taking her position. So she's got the, she's got the ball, her hands are apart, plate's in front of her. She steps forward onto the plate with her hands apart. She cannot have her hands together before she goes to it. There'll be a video on that as well. Taking signs, hands also are separated. So she's on the plate and she's looking in for the signs. She has to have her hands apart. This is to help prevent quick pitches. So these are the various positions of the feet. <coughs> This is the most, most usual one, the upper left one here, where the pivot foot is on the plate and the non-pivot foot is behind it. It does not have to be in contact. It can be, but it's not required. She can have both feet on the plate. Uh, in both these cases, either both heels or both sets of toes, or she can even have the non-pivot foot slightly ahead of the pivot foot, as long as it's within the confines and on top of the plate. Illegal. This is both feet off. In this case here, the non-pivot foot is in front of the plate instead of behind it and, and off, the, off the rubber. In this one here, the non-pivot foot is outside of the boundary of the 24 inches. And in this one, the pivot foot is off the plate. It has to be in contact, at least partially. So the legal pitching delivery, she has to bring her hands together when she starts, when she's ready to start her pitch for one to 10 seconds. So every now and then you'll see them where they just sort of slap their hands together like so. It has to, it, there has to be contact between one, one and 10 seconds. A backward step before or simultaneous with the hands being brought together. So she can't be standing there, put her hands together and then step back. It has to be simultaneous, all right? Simultaneous or before. The pitch starts when one hand's taken off the ball. In other words, the ball is in, in their right hand if they're a right-handed pitcher, and they, they've done their step back. And when they come up and around like so, when that hand separates, that's considered the, the pitching delivery has begun. But she can't step off at that point. She has to complete the pitch. You did your wind if you bounce one forward to go by your foot. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to do this. <laughs> forward step with the non-pivot foot. So the pivot foot remains on the rubber, and as she steps forward, she, she, she steps forward with the non-pivot, and then the pivot foot remains in contact with the ground all the way through the delivery. So if she comes through, that toe has to drag. There has to be a drag. If it, if it lifts off the ground at any time, that can be in, considered an illegal pitch. We'll see some examples of that. An underhand has to be an underhand motion, and as an underhand motion, the ball, it, it come, the, the pitch comes around, and it has to be with the open part of the hand towards coming towards the batter. You can put spin and what have you on the ball, on the release, flicking it like so, or like so to give that, that spin left to right, yes? But you can't come around like so 
and release the ball like so and pour and flip the ball like that. It has to come forward like so with the open hand and then whatever English needs to be put on it is done that way. So prior to bringing the hands together, the pitcher may step out this when she wants to step off the plate. She can, she can do so with either foot. So she's standing there, taking, you've seen this all the time, so she's standing there, taking your sign, she doesn't get it, she doesn't get it, okay, she steps off. She can step off, if she has both feet on the plate, she can step off with either one, we don't care. She's, she's separated, there's no harm, no foul there. When she's brought it together, it has to be the pivot foot, that's the only difference. So she's got it, she's ready to pitch, she brings her hands together and steps off and then decides not to do it, and she steps off with her pivot foot. All right. She hasn't released it yet, so the pitching motion is not hasn't begun. She ha she she stepped back and gone like this, and she can she can step off. See what I'm saying? But only with that pivot foot. Things she may not do: step onto the pitching plate with her hands together. This is to eliminate quick pitching. A rocker step by lifting the pivot foot off the pitching plate at all lifting that pivot foot at all as she steps back. That's a rocker step. We'll have a video on that as well. A motion to pitch without immediately delivering the ball. So no hesitating. You know, she can't begin a pitch. Like that, right? No double motions or anything like that. She, she starts that pitch, it's a full pitch motion. Can't start and stop. Bring the hands together for a second time. That's, that's to help guide the ball in some cases. She'll step back, go around, like that, touch it somehow to help guide the ball through. <clears throat> One time, once that hand comes off the ball, only the pitching motion can happen. After separating the hands, a stop and reverse forward motion. I don't know if I've ever seen that. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> That's, that just seems you know, like, you know, just throw your shoulder out. She can't take more than 20 seconds to deliver the pitch. We're not here to play gotcha with your pitchers. We know that a lot of your, especially in the minors, are, are they're just really uncertain. They're just learning how to do this. I can tell you that if, if I'm standing there, I'm not standing there counting to 20. But we all know that if she's standing there and she's not getting ready to pitch at all, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say, pitch please, I'll be nice about it. Pitch please, you know, and I'll step back and wait and wait. And if, honestly, if some, nebulous amount of time passes when it's just she just doesn't seem to be able to do it I'll say time that's a ball on the batter but I don't want to do that you know this is what we want to do is give them a positive experience while they're while they are uh, learning how to pitch okay what I would suggest is if your if your pitchers having a hard time have your catcher turn to me and say can I have, can I have time blue <laughs> and go out and talk to your pitcher get them reassured get them pitching again that's what we all want just getting the game moving along uh, she can't crow hop, got a video coming up on that. That's, that's establishing a second landing point for the pivot foot. They're supposed to be pushing off from the plate and pitching from there. Crow hops allow them to move forward and establish a second landing point. What that does is reduces the distance, which reduces the coefficient. So she can pitch at X miles per hour from here, and there's a reaction time to that. She pushes off from farther up, that reaction time is shortened. So she can pitch the same speed, but get a shorter reaction time. Leaps, that is just what it means. Both feet leave the ground. Deliberately drop the ball. I don't know what kind of play, what manager thought that one up. You know, that she thinks they're gonna pick somebody off by, uh, oops, and then trying to throw a runner out who saw it as a live ball. I don't know about deliberation. I can't really read their minds from there. I have two daughters, I can't read their minds. Lands fully outside the width of the pitching plate. This is a motion that, that became popular within the last 15 years or so, where they, where they leap over to the side in order to get a lot of underhand, right? So they can get a lot of um, curve on the ball, a lot of good drop. Uh, so that you can see in the college games where they, they actually have drawn those white lines from the sides of the plate. And any land, foot that lands outside of that, well, this is what that rule says too. We don't draw those lines, but if I'm looking right down the alleyway there and I see her one of her, especially her landing foot, the non-pivot foot landing outside of the width of the plate, that's gonna be an illegal pitch. So here's the, the hands together when she, she'll put her hands together before she pitches. <clears throat> so 
you can see how easy it would be to do a, a quick pitch there. Lifting the pivot foot, this is the rocker step. So, that, I see that pivot foot come up at all, that's a rocker, I'm going to call illegal pitch. It's not a dead ball. Anytime you hear an umpire say illegal pitch, all that means is that something interesting may happen from here going forward. Okay, this is definitely um, uh, the hands not coming together properly. And again, one of our distinguished umpires there, not calling an illegal pitch. You can see she barely even, she, she started and then just sort of tapped her hands together as she went. That's not a good legal pitching delivery. Stepping back with her hands together. They're together now, and now she steps back. That's an illegal pitch. Jim and I actually had this. This is one of those ones where we watched her. We watched our uh, the pitcher warming up. I saw her over there from first base. I saw her stepping forward a good five or six inches in front of the plate before she delivered. We have a little sign where it's saying, "I'm watching that. Are you watching that?" Yeah. Well, I'm call it on the very first pitch, and then I don't want to have to call it over and over. If I call it, if you hear an illegal pitch, especially on the very first pitch from your pitcher, come on out, let's discuss it, I'll explain why, and maybe we can get the pitcher to go from there. I don't have to, I don't want to call three illegal pitches in a row before we come out and figure out what's going on. New pitchers. Nobody does that on, no, no pitchers do that on purpose. They know they're going to get called. This is the, this is, <laughs> The leap. I tell you, she almost went into orbit. <laughs> and this wasn't called either. Right, Jim? This was her pitcher pitching motion the entire World Series. Never called once. <laughs> you see how it creates that second landing? She pushes off from there. That makes a 40 mile an hour pitch, a 55 mile an hour pitch. Here's the crow hop, this is classic. This is something that uh, men's uh, uh, fast pitch uh, uses all the time. I learned it from her dad. See that second landing there. That's a good 18 inches forward, and again, increases that coefficient. Gives her that extra push. And here's the pitching outside the width. The, there's that little side hop that they'll use so they can get a lot more under the ball. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, bring the bring the uh, hand, <laughs> hand to the mouth. Bringing the hand to the mouth, um, that's been something that you're allowed to do in softball all along. The only thing that, that a pitcher has to do once they bring their hand to their mouth and they get a little um, extra on there for grip is to touch their jersey in any way. Their cap, jersey, arm, glove, I don't care what they do, just the mouth to something uh, to show that they dabbed it off. And the only time that we're actually going to call that um, an illegal pitch is if she's on the rubber, she puts her hand straight to her mouth and goes to the ball and is ready to pitch at that point. That's going to be applying an illegal substance. Otherwise, if she does that and then stands there for a while, you know, five or ten seconds and then puts her hand in there, I'm not going to call that. I mean, five, ten seconds, there's nothing there anymore. So, and that can be done at any point, outside the circle, inside, or even standing on the pitching plate. The penalty for not wiping off is going to be an illegal pitch, but as I say, the only time we're going to call that is when we see something that's pretty much continuous. Hand, ball, pitch. Any illegal pitch is one that's not made in accordance with these pitching rules, the ones that we were just talking about. Delivered when the pitcher doesn't have their pivot foot in contact with the pitcher's plate. You saw that on the video. Quick return pitch. The catcher throws it back. She sets up and immediately throws the ball. I'm going to call time. That's a quick return pitch and that's illegal. I'm trying to uh, protect your batter. There's a reasonable amount of time that's expected between one pitch and another. And if, you're, and if your pitcher doesn't give that batter a chance to just like 
two or three seconds to get reset and ready for the next one, that's going to be an illegal pitch. Deliver it with a foreign substance applied to the ball. That includes dirt. They can, they can go down with their hands and rub some on their hands, but don't pick up dirt and rub it on the ball. All right, that's a foreign substance. Throw to a base with a pivot foot on the pitcher's plate. Why? Why would you do that? You got runners stuck to the bags. They're not gonna. They're not going anywhere. If one of them steps off at some point, I'm like, hey, you're off base. You're out. <laughs> so there's no point. Penalty if the pitch is a ball, and if the ball is hit any time an illegal pitch is called, this is what I was talking about before. So you're, I'm going to stand out there and I see him and say, that's an illegal pitch. Nice and loud, much louder than that. But you'll hear it. Trust me. Your batter has an option whether to hit it or swing at it or not, and if they hit it. We're going to see what happens after that. If that batter runner makes it to first base and all other runners that are on base make it uh, advance at least one base without being put out, the illegal pitch is forgotten. There's no penalty for it. If, however, the, that isn't met, if anything else happens, the defensive manager can choose, uh, the offensive manager rather, can choose whether to take the penalty or take the play. An example would be you think, okay, she hits it and then she's put out at first base. Well, I'm going to go ahead and take a penalty and have a ball on the batter and bring her back. But what if you had a runner in third base? And while they were throwing that, throwing her out at first, that runner came down and scored. And you determine, yeah, it's a real close game, you know, runs have been really hard. You can elect to go ahead and take the play. So even though you've got an out on the board, you gained a run, just like a sacrifice fly. So think about that. Anytime you hear that illegal pitch and something has happened out there where Better runner did not make it to first base safely, and all the runners did not get to, uh, did not advance at least one bag. You're going to have an option. You come and tell me what that option is. I'm, I'd rather not come over and try to explain it all to you. That's why you're here tonight. Here are some quick pitches where we're going to see some more distinguished blues. This fella here, he must have had a lot to eat or something. He's not really thinking about. And those, those pants are riding low too. Come on, Lou. I mean, she's just like, zip, boom. And a batter standing like, hey, what did I do? Here's another one. She steps into the bag, barely has his hand up. She's looking down. Yeah. When your batter comes to bat, when, when one of us is up there, when your batter, especially when they first come up to bat, I'm going to be observing the pitcher. If she's standing there ready to pitch, I'm going to put my hand up as she approaches the box. All right? I'm going to look at her, see that she's set. She takes her little, place her feet, takes her little swings, looks up. As soon as I see her look up at the pitcher, my hand drops. All right? I'm not calling time. Still a live ball. I'm just telling the pitcher, please don't pitch. All right? If she begins to pitch, I'm going to call time and jump out and say, wait for the batter, please. Okay? So let your pitchers know. We want the, the batter, because they, they become batters later too. This is a, you know, a nice thing to, to do one for the other. Give that batter time. A drop ball is one that slips in the pitcher's hand. It's going to be a live ball as soon as she does that. All right, so she's standing there taking her, taking her sign, or signs or whatever, and the ball falls out of her hand. The ball is live at that point, and all runners can advance. This is on a non-pitch, so she hasn't begun her pitching motion. It's live, and runners may advance until she regains possession of the ball, and then the circle rule is in effect, and they have to either advance or return to the base that they came from. A drop ball is one that goes direct to the ground. A pitch requires lift and carry, so if she drops it as she pitches, she's in that pitching motion, and it slams to the ground and starts rolling or something like that. That's a pitch, and that's going to be called a, a, a ball, and that ball is live. Right? And all pitch, once again, all runners can advance at their peril. So, a pitcher being removed from the circle and returning to pitch. So, you can go out and take that pitcher off the mound, put them in another defensive position, bring in another defensive player from in the outfield, like say, switch your shortstop and your pitcher. They can return a pit as a pitcher any time in the remainder of the game, but only once in that inning. So, you, you, you think you're, you maybe you want to give her a little bit of a rest, you put her out at shortstop, you bring the shortstop in, the shortstop you know, walks five or six girls, say, yeah, okay, you know, come on back. So she, in that inning, she can come back onto the mound. But that's it for that inning. 
still for the rest of the game, once once you you get back in the dugout, she can she can come back again. Majors and minors, if you withdraw a pitcher from the game for a substitute, either offensively or defensively, withdraw for a substitute, she's out. She cannot pitch for the rest of the game. That applies for continuous batting order and batting nine. That's just minors and majors. Juniors and seniors, they can be withdrawn from the game offensively or defensively, even subbed for, and return as a pitcher once per inning, provided she doesn't violate substitution or visits. Thing about this, minors, majors, seniors, all the way through, if you had any visits with your pitcher, and then she is out of the game and then returns, those visits come with her. They don't reset. Let's talk about numbers of visits then. In the minors, you get two in an inning for your pitcher without being asked to remove your pitcher from the mound. So if she's having a hard time, she can go there at least twice and then return to the dugout. If you come out a third time in that inning, it is to replace her. When you finish your second visit with that pitcher, I'm gonna tell you that too, because I'm keeping track of that. As you walk back to the dugout, coach, that was your second visit this inning. I will remind you. Again, I'm not here to play gotcha. Wait there for you, wait there for you. Yeah, you're replacing her now. No, honestly, don't look at us that way. We're, we're just here to enforce the rules. Three per game total. So you can have one in the first, one in the third, one in the fifth, whatever. After that third one, the next time you come out to talk to her, it's to replace her. That's minors. Majors and above, just one per inning. And only two for the entire game. That's something that you definitely have to remember, especially in those uh, seniors <coughs> games that are seven innings. If you've already visited her once, you only get one more. That's per player, right? Per player. That's correct. I keep track of those by, by the um, pitcher's number, and I put the number of visits next to it. And I always put which inning it was, too, just so we're very clear on that, so you, to help refresh your memory. Some of these games run long. Yeah. Do you count uh, the coach walking, let's say, in between innings, things are going on, the coach walks out and talks to her? Is that I do not count that as a visit. You do not. But so some, if your pitcher is. Some umpires do? They shouldn't. Okay. It's not a rule. Okay. If your pitcher is warming up between innings and walks out and is talking to her there, that is not a game situation. You can go, you can talk to her while she's out there warming up, and that's not considered a visit, all right? It's when you call time to stop the game and go out and speak to her that that's considered a charge timeout. Same thing if you substitute a pitcher. You've got the substitute out there. You wanna talk a little strategy with her. I'm still gonna be timing you though, because she gets a certain number of pitches, just like between innings. So if, you, if you're gonna to talk to her and she's not warming up, I'm counting off, okay, that's one lost pitch. You know, another 10, 15 seconds, that's a second lost pitch. And if you keep talking and she's not warming up, you can get down to where she only has one or two warm up pitches and I'm gonna go, okay, let's go, bat her up. So it's a trade off. If she's still pitching, you can talk to her all you want to, I'm still counting those pitches. Any visit to a defensive player counts as a visit. I don't wanna play gotcha here either, but if you've got a catcher, who isn't understanding what you're saying to her and she stands up and goes, time blue, and runs over to the fence and talks to you, you've now visited your pitcher. Okay, so tell her, no, 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 Cindy, <laughs> don't talk to me over there. As soon as she comes over to talk to you, that's con a conference with a defensive player. You also can't relay things like, like talk to your first or third baseman and say, hey, go over and tell Cindy, no, that's relaying a message, that's gonna, I'm gonna count that as a visit too. A pitcher removed from the circle and returning later pitch retains their, their visits. So like I said, I'm keeping track of them. So this is one that and I know is kind of tough on you, on you because you see your pitcher is struggling out there, all right? And you know you, have a, you still have a visit, that, or you may not have any visit to her. You may have some extra visits, whatever. And you want to make sure she looks like she's struggling. You want to ask her how she's doing to decide whether or not you should uh, sub her. When you go out there and talk to her, that's going to count as a visit, even if you decide to sub her. If you don't, if you talk to, if you talk to any defensive player on the way out there, that's considered a visit. So you go out and say, "Hey, how are you feeling?" That's fine. But if it's your, if that's your uh, last visit, or if you, or if you burn one, uh, you're. 
that is considered a visit. That's what I'm, just, that's what I'm saying. Uh, so just think about that before you go out to ask how she's doing. You can ask her from the sidelines, hey, how you doing? That's not, I'm not going to consider that a visit. But walking out onto the field, calling time and walking onto the field will consi be considered a visit if you talk to any defensive player other than a chief and you've announced a substitution. So pitchers can wear compression sleeves. And we're aware what those are. That's the thinner ones that go on there that, that, that help keep the elbow warm and things like that. They can be a solid single color, black, white, gray, or a uniform color. I don't care if one of your uniform colors is a little bit of optic yellow. It can't be an optic yellow compression sleeve. The pitcher's glove can be a solid color or multicolored, but not the color of the ball. There are some gloves I know that have an image of a ball on them. That's going to be umpire's discretion, the umpire's discretion as to whether they're going to allow that pitching glove. So err on the side of caution. If you see something that looks like that, it might be a patch sewn on there, take that off. It, you may have uh, an umpire, and you can't, as before, anything that the umpire deems as being improper equipment can't be uh, protested. All right, some questions on that? Yes, sir? I guess it's kind of pertaining to uh, now when the pitcher's going back to pitcher and the ball goes over their head. Mm -hmm. Is it still is it active? That's a live ball. Live ball. Okay. Yeah, it's a live ball. Right. Anytime there's a throwback, that's me. Anytime the pitcher. Count. Hmm? Everybody's got to count going back. Oh yeah, you bet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The only time that the runners can advance is when the is by the circle rule, which is the pitcher has to lose possession of the ball and has to use one foot inside the circle. That's when anybody off base has to return or advance, or they have to remain on base if that's what they were when that foot entered the circle. How do we feel about optic stitching on the pitcher's glove? Optic yellow? Umpire's discretion. And I can tell you that if, if I have any doubts and that office's manager comes to me and says, I think that that's distracting, I'll say, yeah, you're darn right. That's the way it is. It might be gamesmanship, but I'm, I'm going to err on the side of caution on that. Anything that's optic yellow that has to do with your pitcher, just, you know, try not to let that happen. Anything else? Ed? Explain to me, um, if you uh, are a base runner, you run through first base, you get your single and you're safe. Yeah. Balls return to the pitcher, pitcher back to the circle. Yeah. And the runner on first base is kind of talking to the first base coach. Yeah. As the pitcher's in the circle, yeah. kind of veers off the base, but stays on the orange base, but doesn't, but leaves the white base. Um, what is your call on that? At that point, she is a circle violation, and I'll call so, her out. Yeah, I saw that called about three or four times during All Stars last year. There yeah. are a lot of people that do not know yeah. that. Just the, and the player, they're totally shocked when they get called out. Yeah. And all they just veer off that white base just a little bit. Yeah. They're automatically going to get called. Here's the thing to remember and make it simple, okay? Once there's been a play, or once that player has passed that base, the orange base disappears. So just act like it's not even there anymore. And that's the way you can do it. So if you're a base coach and that runner goes, goes past the base and comes back, you just make sure she stays on that white bat because that orange bag is no longer there. There it is, or they say something. Can, can you guys call them? In what sense? Huh? So by like, saying there it is, I mean that's kind of a negative thing. There it is, state. like it's a good pitch, or yeah. like, like that's the one they hit. There it is. Like if the pitch, I have no is, problem with the that. pitch is just left the bat, the pitcher's hand, yeah. and the parent standing there, strike. Swing. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. See, again, it's our discretion. If I'm gonna, if I'm hearing stuff like, you know, swing or something like that, I'm. This is little league, okay? This is supposed to be uh, much more family oriented and things like that. Yeah, uh, don't come to I, Walnut Creek with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's much more. It's much more family oriented and what have you. If I feel that, if I feel that uh, a particular. <laughs> If I feel a particular spectator or somebody like that is acting in a disruptive manner, I'm going to talk to the, if there's a tournament, I'm going to talk to the tournament director. If there's the coach, I'm going to ask the coach not to. We're generally not going to speak directly to people in the crowd because that's playing their game. All right? If you, as a coach, know that one of your parents is like that, 
have a little come to Jesus meeting with them before the season starts and tell them that, that you personally are not going to put up with it, okay? This is a, while this is a competitive league, it's not travel ball, okay? And it's not the damn World Series in any sport. This is out here to have fun, and we're going to be positive. Thank you. Okay, listen, I appreciate you staying this long. We have one more section to go through, but it's a very, very important section because it's the circle. It's what softball is about. Okay, this is the circle, eight foot radius circle. You have to have one of these if you are going to play a softball game. If you do not have it, you cannot play a softball game. At worst, you know, you'll have, you know, dig it out with your foot if uh, it has not been chalked in. But you can't play the game without a circle. So, what does it mean for a pitcher to be in the circle? It's very important. And what it means is that both of the pitcher's feet have to be fully within or partially within the circle. Outside the circle, outside the circle, within the circle, within the circle. So when a pitcher has possession of a ball in the circle and is not attempting to make a play, is not throwing to a base, and uh, attempting a play, a fake throw is considered a play. And what we mean by fake throw is a pitcher doing this. This is considered attempting to make a play. This is not because you can't make a play with the ball down here. So the second she begins to raise the arm in the circle, then that's considered um, uh, a play. Once the pitcher has the ball in the circle, not making a play, and the runner is on a base, the runners cannot disengage from their base until in minors the pitch has been made and the pitch reaches the batter. Not reaches home plate, but reaches the batter. In majors and above, the pitch leaves the pitcher's hand. Do we actually know exactly where that ball is leaving? No, what do we do as an umpire? When the arm is straight down like this, parallel to the leg, that's when we consider the ball to have been released, even though it may not be released till right here. So once it gets to this point, that's when you're in majors and uh, seniors, your runner can disengage from the base. What's the penalty if a runner leaves early? Time, immediate dead ball. We don't look to see what happens. Immediate dead ball, runner left early, the runner is out. And it's no pitch. Watch her and watch the pitcher once her arm comes straight down and look to see where this runner is and this is super slow mo by the way <laughs> so she's disengaged now we consider that the runner could have left but you can see that runner is all is already a full step off we have a good umpire there. This umpire actually did call it for me. Well, you get the good ones. Yeah, I get the good ones. <laughs> if a runner is off a of base after a delivered pitch or as a result of a batter completing a turn at bat and the pitcher is in that circle and is not making a play, the runner must immediately, and that's what the rule book states, immediately attempt to advance or return to a base. In other words, the pitch has been made, the runner comes off and is standing there, the ball goes back into the circle, the pitcher has it, that runner who's off the base must immediately retreat back to the base they were at or advance to the next base. What is immediately? 
It's whatever the umpire believes immediately to be. So know that some umpires count. At the minor level, they may count slower. One, two, three, and then they're gonna call that runner out. Maybe in seniors, they'll go one, two, three. Other umpires will see a runner off, look to see if the pitcher has it, look back, and if the runner is still hasn't advanced or retreated, will then immediately call it, okay? So train your players that when that ball goes back to the, to the pitcher and they're off the base, immediately go one way or the other and continue in that direction. What's the penalty? Dead ball, immediate, runner is out. A runner on a base path is allowed one stop. This is something that's not fully understood by a lot of folks in softball. A runner on a base path is allowed one stop if the pitcher has the ball in the circle not making a play. In other words, a player is in motion and the ball goes back to the pitcher, that player may continue on to the next base, touch that base, go all the way to the next base, stop, and then retreat. They're allowed one stop. So a batter runner on a walk may overrun first base or continue to second base. You hear this especially from parents, throw the ball back in the circle so it'll stop the runner. It doesn't stop the runner. The runner is allowed one stop. A runner is allowed to overrun first base on a walk. Once they turn around, that's considered a stop. Then they have to immediately go back to the base or they can just keep running around the bases, <laughs> right? And the second your pitcher raises their arm like this, then all bets are off and all runners can leave. A batter, run okay, so that was the walk. Okay, a pitcher with a ball in the circle not making a play does not force a runner to stop running. So again, the ball goes back into the to the pitcher, to the pitcher, pitcher not making a play in the circle. That runner is not forced to stop. They have, if they haven't made their stop yet, they can keep going. Once a runner stops at a base and the pitcher has the ball in the circle, that runner then must stay on that base. So they've gone to first base, they're standing on first base, pitcher has the ball, they then cannot leave that base. That's an immediate time runner is out. Okay, let's see some examples. This will not be a circle violation. So, we're going to watch it first. I want you to watch, it, watch just the runner at third base. Ball is pitched. She comes off. Ball comes back to the circle. She returns to the base. Okay, now I want you to watch the runner who walked on this pitch, ball four. Ball is in the circle, she continues to run. She's allowed to do that. No circle violations here, okay? Ball is in the circle, runner must stay on the base. Guess what? Pitcher walks out of the circle, now the runner may run because the ball was no longer in the circle. No circle violation. Get to the outfield. She's coming back. She can change direction. Why? The ball was not in the circle yet. The pitcher did not have possession of the ball. So no circle violation. Now we're gonna have circle violations. Now we're gonna get our outs. Because we're umpires, we like outs. That was not immediate. She's just standing there. So that's gonna be a circle violation she did not quote, immediately return or advance. 
this will also be a circle violation. If you move one direction, you've got to continue in that direction. You cannot move one direction and then go the opposite direction. <coughs> so watch her what she does here. Moves towards home plate, makes a second move towards home plate. That's a circle violation. What constitutes the move, though? Is it, they don't have to pick their feet up, they just have to move their shoulder forward? If you're doing like this, Is I'm going to consider that a move. Okay. This runner has gotten to first base. The ball will be in the circle, so the runner must stay planted at first base, but she doesn't. Pitcher has the ball. Pitcher has the ball in the circle, not making a play. And we have another good umpire. I gave all the bad umpires to Adam. Thanks. Okay, questions about circle. Yes, Steve. Folks, folks, can we keep it down so we can hear this? There's a common belief when the runner overruns first base, if she turns to the right, she's committed to going back to first base. Turns to the left, she's not anything unless she starts towards second. Is that right? So, what Steve is bringing up is that if a runner overruns first base, baseball, softball, doesn't matter, overruns first base, there's a myth that if they turn to their right and go back, that's all right. If, however, they overrun first base, they turn to their left towards the field, towards second that now they can be put out. That is not the case. They must actually make a move, an attempt at second for that to happen. So a runner can run past first base, make a wide turn like this, and come back. In the umpire's judgment, that runner didn't make an attempt. But if, but if they come this way and then go, that's an attempt. They can be tagged on the way back to first base. Questions? Really? I, well, I just was thinking that, you know, if you're coming back around, you're in, going to, to the left, you're, you're in the field. It doesn't matter. There is no distinction if you're in the foul territory, fair territory. The rule is if you make an attempt to the next base, so just turning around is not an attempt. There was a question back here. Was that question withdrawn? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. I, I got a question. Yes. On the one play where you had the, the where it showed the example with the player that got walked, I guess, and then they kept going to second, right? Correct. Can they just keep going to third? Absolutely. They can go to home. Say it's not a walk, say it's like a hit, right? And they got in there going to the, say the players running around a second, and the, uh, you know, the pitcher has the ball in the circle, and the players say they're right before second base, they keep going, they can keep going to third as long as they don't stop at all. Absolutely, if they haven't second. made a stop. Okay. So on that walk attempt, you can walk to second, you can run to sec second, you can run to uh, go to first, second, go to third, and then go home. It's only if you make a stop do you have to then immediately advance or retreat. Okay. So just one further thing on the circle. One of the common plays that you will see over and over, and I will I assume you're going to be teaching your girls defensively and offensively about this, is that when you have a runner at third base and there is a walk, many teams are very aggressive and will have that player who walked go to second. The hope is, is that the pitcher will turn and they will throw to second and the runner at third can come home. Sometimes it's trading an out 
for a run. Know that that runner in third, if that ball goes back into circle, I don't care what that runner is doing who has just walked. What I'm looking at is that runner at third base, and if the ball's in the circle, are they leaving the base? Are they standing there off the base? If they are, it's gonna be an out. But what you're trying to do is this. You're trying to get the pitcher to look at that runner going to second, and the second she raises her arm, guess what? That runner at third can now run home because this is an attempted play and she can disengage from the base. Yes. If she were standing on the base, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, bless you folks. Thank you. This is the last slide. So, now we get to philosophy. <clears throat> philosophy about Little League. Who assures a safe and fun game for the kids? I don't care at what level you're, play, you're coaching, managing, or umpiring. Um, these are kids. Seniors, they are kids. They are children. So, 